I am Sean Sullivan. I'm a co-chair of the Command Line Interface Special Interest Group. And today we're gonna, I'm gonna give an introduction to our SIG. And so what are we gonna talk about today? So initially I'm gonna talk about the uh, three sub-projects of the SIG CLI. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about what we've been uh, working on recently. Um, and what I think is going to be useful to uh, some of you is how do you get involved and how do you start contributing? Um, at the end, there's going to be some links and references. And finally, uh, I think we're going to have plenty of time to do a question and answer at the end. So what is the SIG CLI? And this is from the SIG CLI charter. Um, the command line interface uh, SIG is responsible for kube control and its related tools. And it focuses on general purpose command line tools and libraries that interface with the Kubernetes APIs. And these are the three sub-projects uh, that uh, the, the CLI, uh, SIG CLI is responsible for. So why don't we dig into each one of these sub-projects? So this is the one that almost all of you are going to be familiar with. And up until recently, uh, kube control was the entirety of SIG CLI. It's only recently that we've added a couple of new sub-projects. Um, and one of those sub-projects is what's called the CLI SDK. And so what we did was we refactored kube control to get some of its, its core functionality and we put it in its own repo. And the main motivation for this was so that we can, uh, we can write plugins. So we could reuse that functionality in our plugins and any other clients that, that might need it. So in addition uh, to the CLI SDK, there is a repo for uh, a sample CLI plugin that, that Juan Vallejo uh, in the front wrote. So if you have any questions, uh, just you, could, you have the author right in front of you. you could, you could bother him. Um, and so the third sub-project that the SIG CLI is responsible for is relatively new, and I think I'm going to spend a few minutes trying to go over it because it's so new and most people don't have any context, um, and it's called Customize. And so Customize lives in the space of uh, resource configuration management tools. And some other tools in that space are like Helm or Case on it. And Customize has a different approach to uh, resource management, whereas Helm and Case on it and other tools usually do their configuration management through templating. Customize is actually, it, it uses patches so that you don't have to modify your, your YAML. Um, as you would in, in other tools. It's actually real configuration that gets combined in different ways. And, uh, and so, it, it, like I said, it has a, a different uh, approach than the template-based uh, configuration management tools. And so, when I looked at the readme for customize, uh, I saw one of the lines was um, that it's like make and that it what it does is declared in a file, and it's like said, in that it emits text. And to be honest, I was, I was a little bit confused with that. And so I actually talked to some of the, the main developers on it. And, and so what, what they meant was the make file is a special customization.yaml file, which describes how each one of these other, like a service.yaml uh, or deployment.yaml is going to be put together. Um, and so, actually, I'm going to try to, there's going to be a simple example here. Um, again, this is from the customize uh, readme. And as it shows, there is a, you know, the customiz customization.yaml is kind of like the make file, which describes uh, how this process is going to work. And it describes, you know, what, what are the resources that it cares about. And here it's deployment.yaml and service.yaml. And here are the, the two resources themselves. Um, and then, actually, in this example, it doesn't really show it. But you can, for instance, add uh, a prefix so that 
in your production cluster, you have you know, the, the actual name of the, uh, of the resource is going to be prod WordPress or staging.wordpress. Um, and so, as you can see, the YAMLs are actually, uh, uh, th they have no templating in them, and they are valid YAML, uh, configuration YAML. So, so this, this example is going to be fairly uh, simple, and I'll point you in the direction of, of how we can, uh, how you can find out more if you're, uh, if you're interested. But in that example, you, could, you would have, uh, here's what the, the file structure would look like. It would have that customization.yaml and then the other resources, uh, the service.yaml, deployment.yaml. And then in order to emit the valid uh, resource configs, you would call customize build. So, so that's slightly, that, that's going to be not completely true because as I'm going to describe later on, one of the things we're working on is combining customize into Coop Control, so that you can you can use it, and I'll I'll get to that in a bit. That's I know that's probably slightly confusing for now, but hopefully I'll address it later. So what have we been working on? Well, I first wanted to to discuss Coop Control plugins. Um, so. Tomorrow at uh, 10.50, there's going to be the SIG CLI deep dive, which will more thoroughly dig into uh, uh, plugins. Um, and that'll be uh, uh, at least partially presented by, by Juan here in the front seat. Um, so another initiative that we've been working on, and I've been working on personally, is that we've been trying to move the Kube control library out of Kubernetes core into its own repository. Um, and trying to break the dependencies that we have in, in Kube Control, that the dependencies on the, the core Kubernetes library. Um, and I'll, I'll give a little bit more information on that in a second. So we've, we've actually um, moved some of the functionality that is uh, in Kube Control into the server to make the server more of a thin client um, and to, to be able to, so that other clients will also be able to easily uh, reuse this functionality. Um, and uh, along that same vein, uh, that's what uh, we've done with Kube Control Apply. So Kube Control Apply is now, which is you know, our main uh, merging and, and creation, the declarative merging and creation ability uh, and command that functionality is all moving into the server. Um, and most of that development is actually being done with the API machinery team, but it, it certainly affects Kube Control. So uh, finally, uh, one of our recent initiatives is that we are integrating uh, customized, the, the aforementioned customized subproject into Kube Control. So what's dig into Kube Control plugins for a little bit. Um, so our new uh, mechanism for implementing plugins is get style plugins. And what, is, what does that mean? So that means that when you create a binary uh, that is a plugin, as long as you put it in your path at, and it has a particular uh, name, uh, naming convention, then it will be run by Kube Control. And so an example would be, um, if, like for the sample plugin, let's just pretend that it's uh, your subcommand or your plugin is, is called command foo. So you would create a binary, and it could be a bash script, it could be in any language that you like, um, as long as the, the path, uh, as long as it's within the path, Kube Control We'll first try to run it as a core command. If it doesn't find it, then it's going to start searching through the path for a particular binary called kubectl-foo. And if it finds it, then it'll pass the environment variables and it'll pass the parameters onto that plugin. So these are more Git style, more flexible plugins. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's going to be a talk on, on that in depth tomorrow at 10.50. So 
the Coop control, Coop control plugins were um, the main motivation for the refactor of Coop control into the CLI runtime uh, repository so that the plugins can reuse major Coop control functionality. Um, so we've also begun a, uh, a manager for plugins so that we have kind of day two functionality kind of how to update, how to discover plugins. Um, I'll be honest, that's, that's pretty, um, it, it's in a very protean state. It's not, it's not well formed. Um, and if that's something that you're interested in, please see me afterwards. I think that they are looking for developers in order to, to take that to a better state. Um, and I've already mentioned the deep dive tomorrow. So. Just to dig in a little bit more about what we're doing to move the Coop cont uh, control code base into its own repository. So currently, this, uh, the Coop control code lives in two locations that are in Kubernetes main, Kubernetes core. And because of that, it's kind of grown to depend on things that it shouldn't depend on. Um, and so that is actually our biggest challenge in, in trying to move it into its own code base is that there are quite a few difficult to untangle dependencies. Um, but we're actually pretty close to it now. Um, and, and the advantages we feel that we'll have by moving Coop Control into its own code base are we, we feel that we'll have faster de uh, development velocity and we think that we can simplify the code base. And so if you're interested, there is this umbrella issue that des uh, describes this effort. So just to talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing in moving functionality into the server. Um, so we feel that we don't want a thick client. So whatever complications or complexity that we have in the client, make it difficult for other clients to actually use that functionality. For instance, like Coop Control Apply. So if there were another simple client that wanted to, uh, to uh, duplicate the, uh, all of the code that in, in the uh, client apply, it's just not possible. So, but if, as long as, if it's just an endpoint on the server, then it's significantly easier for uh, other clients to be able to, uh, to use this functionality. And so the, the two efforts uh, currently underway are, and, and we've already done most of this, we've moved uh, printing to the server side. Um, so all of the, the logic that knows about particular fields to print, that was a significant amount of complexity to be in, in Kube Control, and it's been moved to the server. Um, and, and again, Juan, is, it was central in that effort. Um, and we still have a fallback now in Kube Control, but eventually that's gonna, that, all of that complexity is gonna go away in our client. Um, and it's, again, it's a, the, the same motivation for moving apply to the server side so that it can be reused by other clients and, and only maintained in one place. So one of the, the efforts that's, that's currently underway is the, uh, as I mentioned, our previous uh, sub-project customized the template-free YAML uh, configuration sub-project. We intend to move that into uh, our, our standard client, the, the Kube Control client. And so what, is, what does that mean? So I tried to give an example here of what it would mean. So one of the ways that we, uh, we send our configuration to the API server is, is with apply, and we'll do it with a minus F and then the directory that will have numerous YAML uh, configuration files. Um, so if we are able to integrate this tool with Kube Control, then we can actually, if you have your customization.yaml, kind of that, the, the analog being that make file, it will actually combine them in, in uh, the way that's described in that customization.yaml before it's applied. 
So it's actually transparent. So the only way, uh, so, so if you want to, to use this, then you would organize your, uh, your config uh, with, uh, with customization.yaml, and that functionality will automatically be called if it finds the customization.yaml in that directory. So I hope that was, so, so if, you, if you have any questions, then we have the, the Q&A session uh, later, and then I'm, again, I'm gonna be here afterwards if you guys, if that wasn't clear. Um, so, so this is, I think, near and dear to a lot of people's heart, which is how do you get involved? So I'm gonna mention some resources here. Um, and, and hopefully uh, this will give you an ability to how to start. So let me first uh, let you know that we recognize that there are, there's quite a gap between being a competent software developer and being able to get your first PR in the SIG CLI or even elsewhere in the Kubernetes code base. There, there, it's, it's a major gap. And we recognize that we need to do better and providing resources for you to, to actually bridge that gap. Um, and, and it's probably cold comfort now, but we're actually in the process of trying to create resources to help you bridge that gap. Um, and so I think one of our best resources, and I think what's probably the most productive uh, way of initially getting involved in the SIG CLI is the Slack channel. So, Sometimes there, there'll be a lot of discussions of the minutia that is going to be kind of not as, uh, it, you know, might not be as, as useful to, to begin with, but you'll be able to identify who it is that can help you with your questions. And in addition to, to the Slack channel, uh, we have our bi weekly meetings on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And I think that that's actually a, a great way to. Once you, you sit in on the, it's the, the Zoom, once you sit in on the, the video uh, chat, you're, you'll actually get an idea of you know, what we're working on. And, and you could even you know, pipe in and ask questions. Um, yeah, I th and in addition, here, let me just open this up and see if we can. So th this is our, the agenda and the, uh, the meeting notes which also at the very top has some uh, incredibly useful links to the Zoom, our calendar entry. Um, the test playbook is, is uh, how we keep track of the test grid uh, that we have for, for Six CLI. But you can see like back on December uh, 5th, if I could get this correct, um, we, you know, what, what the items are on the agenda and how, how it works. Um, if there was a particular um, area that you wanted to address, you can actually put it in the proposed topic. So you could see in the next meeting we plan to talk about, or at least we've, we've scheduled time for the, the crew, uh, aforementioned crew plugin manager. Um, and yeah, those, those are two topics that we, we have set up for now. Um, was any of that showing? Um, so another way to uh, figure out what we're working on, even what, besides sitting in on my talk, um, is we have a GitHub project, which we call release tracking. Um, and let's see. And, and that actually, you can see it has the umbrella issue for uh, for kubectl independence, we say, it says remove kubectl dependencies on KK. Uh, there's the updating the plug it, plugin mechanism. Um, and so here's the, the things that we're working on right now. And we also have a prioritized uh, bug list. So one of the things that you may want to look at, which is uh, the issues, uh, the kubectl issue, the kube control issues, and the label good first issue. So right now, we only have two of these issues which are uh, of this label, but we plan on putting more effort into ensuring that we have, uh, we've curated and triaged our issues so that 
uh, everybody would know what are the issues that would be best to work on to start off with. Okay. So, so here's some info on the, the who to reach out to, um, the, the tech leads and, uh, and the chairs. Um, and, and here uh, I've, I've just put in some useful links uh, that maybe you, you could leverage in the future. Okay, so I think that we've gotten to the point where you guys get to ask me questions. So if I'm unable to answer, um, I hope to point you in the correct direction, but I'll try to answer uh, whatever questions that you may have. So Juan is going to help me out if you just raise your hand. Uh, if anybody has a question, uh, Juan will be able to give you the, the microphone. What are the backward compatibility implications of moving functionality to the server? Uh, what, what, what's the goal? Like, what, what are your thoughts on backwards compatibility over this long-term? So, so backwards excuse me, backwards compatibility is a major issue. That's, it's a good point. Um, what we usually do is so in Kubernetes, the standard for SKU uh, version SKU is that. Um, Kubernetes will uh, support both like one version prior and one version after. So like a version 112 would also support 113, 112, and 111. And if it's beyond that scope, then we, we don't guarantee anything. Um, but it requires several releases. Once you, once you move functionality to the server, um, then you're going to have to, you'll, we usually have fallback to the client side. It's like, oh, this server doesn't support it. Um, and we will have that fallback for several releases until it falls outside the window. Is it okay if I step off the lectern? Yeah. Uh, as far as moving the print functionality to the server, does that mean that formatting is done on the server, or does that simply mean that the selection of the fields is done on the server? Because I've never seen any way right now to output like JSON or XML instead of like pre-formatted tabular, and that seems really unfriendly. So, so it is actually a new Go struct called a table. So it's just tabular. So, yeah. Is that unfriendly? So you can, um, yeah. So as I mentioned before, it's you know putting this functionality on the server is going to allow other clients to be able to use it, um, and we we actually don't want all of this complexity in the client. We want a thinner client, and so if you have it on the client, then it has to understand every single type and all of its fields. And, and yeah, we're moving towards a, in order to get rid of skew problems, in order to remove the dependency on uh, um, types, we're, we're trying to move towards more just unstructured uh, blobs and not understanding the go types. And in order to, and this is one of the efforts to kind of help us in that in that vein. So you look you look really so dubious. So the so the logic is is on the server, right? It's only in one place. So different clients are going to actually. Mm-hmm. 
So, so the, the, ta the table was more, it's, you could think of it as XML. It's just a way to present the data, right? So you, you don't have to show all of the columns. You don't even have to show all the rows. It's, it is a way to organize the data to send to the client. So, yeah, so that's, yeah, that's not, that's the direction that it's going and, and I don't see it changing. So, but if, if you'd like to discuss it more and, and especially, you know, I mean, we, we'd love to see feedback. Um, it's, it's already been implemented a couple of releases ago. Um, and so, you know, but if, you, if you'd like to give feedback, we'd love to hear it. Um, and, and if you want to, let's, let's talk afterwards. So with the, the move of the customized build process into kube control, mm -hmm. what is the plan for the other aspects of the customized tool, like the edit functionality, things like that? So, so the customize will still be a standalone alone binary, if you like. And if you want to use it directly within kube control, you just uh, would send as one of the parameters a directory that has the the customization.yaml and the, the config that's organized in that directory, in, in that fashion. It's just the build part. Right, so, so the implementation is that um, we, we have in the CLI runtime, in that, that part that I told you that was refactored, that repository, we have what's called a, a resource builder. And that resource builder, uh, it's implemented as, as kind of a, a visitor where it will, within the code, you, you will be presented in a for loop with all of the objects that have been uh, currently, as they've been like marshaled into ghost trucks. Um, and uh, so that is the, the touch point for where customize is now connected. It's, uh, so that visitor, normally it would just, it would you know, take the YAML and, and uh, change it, modify it into the ghost struct. Well, it knows now that there's a customization.yaml file. And so it will you go through that process to create uh, the full YAML using the customized process and then change it into the ghost structs. Did that make any sense? Okay. So, so we hope to, this is actually under discussion, but we hope to, uh, if we implement it that way, actually it's, it's a PR that's out now. If we implement it that way, then the custom, uh, customized functionality will be available in plugins, for instance, because plugins are gonna reuse the, the CLI runtime. So how do we know what should be a plugin versus implemented on the API server? So. Yeah. <clears throat> The example I'm thinking of is, we kind of talked about this earlier, is being able to address, have a command address all namespaces. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like something you would want to be able to hit at an, a, at an API endpoint as well as on the CLI. Right. So, Juan, do you want to mention your, your sample plugin and what that does with namespaces? Uh, sure. So, um, it is possible with plugins to address some of this, this lack of functionality, if you want to call it that. Um, the, the sample CLI plugin, like Sean mentioned, uh, does essentially allow you to, um, you know, sort of add some of this functionality to, to the CLI. Uh, so, like right now, you can you can clone the sample CLI plugin, compile it, and uh, it'll essentially behave like, uh, you know, this really minimal uh, command that'll allow you to, uh, you know, it, it'll modify your cube config underneath. Uh, to change the namespace. It honors config flags like context, uh, user, and anything else. And uh, essentially, you know, allows you to, without knowing what a kubeconfig uh, file is, uh, persist you know, uh, then a namespace or context or, or user information, depending on how you operate. Did that answer? Uh, sort of here? So, so, so I think there's a more general question there, too, which is, how do you extend kube control? And I think that there's, 
uh, from my perspective, there's two main tools. There's the plugins, and there's the the uh, the controllers. So to like CRDs to extend the API. Um, and so we've seen other uh, other projects. Uh, for instance, Istio, the service mesh, right? They have their own uh, command line interface. And it was built two years ago, so it, it, it kind of forked from Kube Control. But a lot of the stuff is the same, and now they have to keep rebasing. Um, and so in the future, what we think is a productive approach for these different CLIs and these different projects is to base it on Kube Control. And if you have specialized functionality that Kube Control doesn't uh, give you, then you can add binaries through plugins, or you can add, extend the API with CRDs and your custom controllers to implement the business logic of those, uh, those new resources. So, so I think if Istio were starting today on a, on a CLI, it probably would have been better um, to, to have plugins for the Istio specific functionality and then also to add some Istio specific CRDs. Um, and, and actually, I think that that's the way that they're moving is they're trying to get rid of some of the complexity in their CLI. And I think it, at least partially they've moved uh, to some new CRDs, some new, some new uh, uh, custom resources. Is there any plan right now to do a plugin registration in order to prevent a uh, conflict of verbs so that CRDs uh, can kind of not trample on each other? So, so that is what the, the crew um, project is meant to address. Um, and like I mentioned before, it's not in a great state right now. Um, and if it's something that you're interested in, um, then I know that uh, there are people who would love to see extra development resources. So, so one of the people that, if you're really interested, you want to talk to is uh, Ahmet Balkan. Um, I'll, let's, let me see you afterwards. Um, but yeah, I could point you in the direction of where that development is happening. Uh, there is the link there, which would be like kind of the starting point that's, that was in the slide uh, deck. Um, but, but yeah, we recognize that the kind of the day two operations for plugins are not as well supported now for discovery and updating. And, and the kind of disambiguation, I guess, that you were describing. Following up a little bit on that, um, the part of his question that struck me as interesting was more about the preventing CRDs from stepping on each other. Is that, that's not Cube Control's job, is no, it? No, no, no. Okay. So the, it's just so about the keep keeping plugins corralled. Yeah, yeah, sorry if I if I were, doing. if I'm sorry if I did if I uh, spoke incorrectly. But yeah, CRDs are kind of a different domain. It's going to those are uh, organized through the API server. Um, I'm curious about uh, as someone who works. I don't know how much of your job or life cube control consumes. Um, but Plenty. how do you feel about the fact that everybody seems intent on abstracting it away with custom tools? Um, so can you dig into that a little bit so more, the, uh, what you mean by The custom? Airbnb presentation in this morning's keynote is another in a long line of examples. It seems like everybody who spends much time with Cube Control winds up building at least a bunch of shell aliases and yeah. at most a whole system to abstract it away from the perspective of a company or a group mm -hmm. of developers. So, so, that, so I think that that comes back to exactly what we were talking about before. So, so I think that now we have actually a pretty good set of tools to extend Kube Control so that you don't have to wrap it in these special shells. Um, you know, if you now have plugins, so like if you want to do your special Airbnb thing, you can, you know, this particular Kube Control command, it'll be, you know, Kube Control Airbnb foo, um, that particular binary. Um, or uh, which is what is, uh, has been a, a really popular method now, as, as I mentioned, is extending the API with these custom resources and then building the, the custom controllers that 
implement the logic of those, those resources. And, and so actually, I would highly recommend if, if that's the, uh, if you find yourself moving in that direction towards custom resources, which is, is what feels to be like a really powerful uh, avenue these days, um, then I would recommend looking into a project called Kube Builder. So Kube Builder will generate so, so a lot of these custom controllers are, uh, and we're getting a little bit away from Kube Control, but uh, these, these custom controllers are in many ways just a bunch of boilerplate code. And so if you look at the sample controller, um, you'll see that you know, a lot of it is just boilerplate, and then there's just this small space where you're putting your business logic in for your particular custom resource. And, and so the Kube Builder actually will generate most of this boilerplate code, it'll generate tests. It's actually, uh, in my opinion, a really, really exciting uh, project. And uh, one of the talks, there's a talk on Kube Builder, um, and Phil is gonna be giving that talk. When is that talk, Phil? Uh, it's Thursday. Thursday? So, so look up that in your schedule. Um, if you're using CRDs and, control, uh, and custom controllers, that's the way you wanna go. It's, and it's getting a lot of momentum. Uh, there are a lot of links in the slides, but the slide deck doesn't appear in that. I, you know, that, that was my bad. I are those haven't available uploaded somewhere? It yeah, yeah, I haven't uploaded it yet, but it will happen directly after this. One uh, follow-up on the folks building, wrapping Kube Control uh, to build high-level tools. Uh, some of the reason that's done is because there is a gap in terms of functionality that folks need, uh, that's table stakes, such as rolling updates for config maps, for instance, um, or being able to uh, declaratively set up namespaces across all resources in a particular project, or uh, being able to take ready-made applications and then patch them, right, without uh, forking and directly modifying them. And so you see stuff like Spinnaker, for instance, uh, provides this functionality. Um, that's a, a need, and, and Kube Control does not. Uh, in one dot thirteen, that won't be true. There's been a long project called Customize that's been developed for about a year now. Um, Lyft just gave a talk yesterday about how they use Customize uh, to do a bunch of stuff, such as uh, sidecar injection um, for Envoy, and, and do actually very complicated things, uh, decryption of pulling secrets or decrypting secrets. Um, and, so, and so that sort of functionality is getting merged into Kube Control directly. So Kube Control Apply now will support a lot of these features that higher level pieces were implementing before. And what we envision is that folks still will want like pipeline tools. For instance, Knative pipelines, folks are gonna want that for venting um, or they're gonna want UIs that uh, help display what's going on, but, and, and we love that and we're perfectly happy with that, uh, but that they don't have to re-implement table stakes such as uh, config map name generation and then they pull that directly from the tool. So, so in my opinion, uh, building your tool around kube control, the, the central premise has to be that you're talking to an API server, right? So obviously, Kube Control is going to be the, you know, the most mature way to talk to an API server. And if so, for instance, with Istio, they they talk to a, an API server, but then they also have extra functionality. So it, I think if they were re-implementing today, it would make sense to use these these two mechanisms of, of plugins and then the, the CRDs with the custom controllers, uh, just because just so they don't have to re-implement talking to an API server, which is, uh, you know, it's not as easy as as you would you would think. Yeah. Uh, Dave, did you talk about the uh, data-driven commands? Uh, no, I don't. I didn't dig into that. Okay, sorry, so, I, I showed up late. Sorry, but. Um, Another thing, instead of uh, plugins, another thing we're looking at is many of the Kube Control commands take user input in the form of 
flags or files and then construct one or more requests to the API server, send those requests, then take the response back and format it and output it. And that is actually something you don't need to compile in, in Go code for, right? It's, uh, web browsers have solved this problem, right? With HTML, you want a form or something, you send it to the server, send it back. You don't need to compile every website into Chrome. Um, and so in 114, we will be prototyping and, and probably have an alpha version of uh, allowing users to define templates uh, that are populated from flags and then dynamically uh, provide queue control commands without the need to download and install plugins. Uh, and one issue that helps resolve is uh, like plugins, uh, namespace collisions, I think has been brought up in the past as like, what if two people name their plugin the same thing? But CRDs and APIs already have namespace space, or they already have naming collision built in, and so we can use that same mechanism to um, avoid collision or, or prioritize the specific uh, commands. So I think we might have gone over a couple minutes. Is that, is that correct? So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end that here, but I'm gonna be here for a few minutes. Anybody who wants to, uh, to ask any further questions, uh, please, please let me know, and uh, if we could get together to talk about some more. <laughs>